Okay. We live. Let's see. Uh, it says we're still preparing. And instead of, uh, I know it said Brother Hassan, but we're actually going to have Brother Taj join us. And he was making a few uh, errands, and he's wrapping up those errands, but he'll be joining us. Just so there's clarity yeah. on what's going on with him. Yeah. All right, looks like we're live. Um, and feel free, like everyone on here, to repost on your walls or whatever. You just It's on the Soul Stories page, if you know where that is. Okay. Yes, yes. All right, y'all. It's part three. We're vibing. This is Baby Town Production. And I myself am shined on the truth. And we are working with some amazing folks. We got Danny in the building from Soul Stories Denver. Can you say hi to everybody, Danny? Hi, how's it going? Um, super pumped to work with you sean for a third week i feel like all of these have been super powerful and i've learned from every one of them and i'm excited to get going with this one too nice nice <clears throat> and what i really think is dope about this time around is we got outside of brother danny uh we got four black men at the table and i know all these brothers from different walks of life whether it's art school and life uh, brotherhood, you know what I mean? Like we we all have connected in different ways. And it's really an honor to share this space because I think right now, like I'm hearing a lot of different messages and the Hello, world all these brothers that. from different walks. Um, so within within this dialogue, I just hope that as men, in particular black men, we can talk a little bit about what we need to do for the black community and how we can elevate one another's voices and opportunities so that's what tonight's going to be about hopefully everybody on facebook live is able to feel these vibes because they're needed right now we need a lot of love and before we get started today you know how we do that is if you've been logging on previously we are gonna start off with some meditation so to get everything going if you could put your back straight wherever you are, if you're in the car, you know what I mean? I see you, Brother Taj, <laughs> staying safe with the COVID. Um, we're going to put our back straight against whatever is behind us, relax our shoulders. If you are able to, close your eyes. If you want to, close your eyes. Just start to pay attention to your breath. It's very easy for us to take for granted the breath that we are gifted with as we sleep, the breath that we are gifted with when we're in love, when we have kids, whatever cycle, whatever part of life we're at, it's easy to take for granted this breath. So I just want you to pay attention to it. Now, if you could breathe in through the nose, hold it in your stomach, and release through the mouth. Breathe one more time through the nose. This time, keep the breath in your chest. and breathe out through the mouth. And on this last breath, I want you to go as deep as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. Breathe in through the nose. Deep, deep, deep. Hold it in your neck. And release through the mouth. Let your shoulders sink. And after about three to five seconds, feel free to open your eyes. 
and return to the space. Uh, see your ring um, between now and the weekend. All right. All right, man. Be safe out there. All right. So, <clears throat> in honor of her birthday, of course, I'm going to read some words from Ms. Shakur. Um, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you, Brother Hundo P. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that, that poetry that you spit for us? And can you also let us know who you are and what you do? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, I just wanted to first and foremost, uh, celebrate, um, Asada Shakur's birthday today. Um, as some of us may know, and some of us may not, uh, very well-known social activist who has seeked asylum in Cuba for some time. Uh, and was very much, I felt like the epitome of um, black excellence, black beauty, uh, black knowledge, black power. Um, and so I just felt that it was appropriate to share her words over mine uh, to start out the day. And then in addition, who I am, what a deep question, my brother. <laughs> um, but uh, to keep it simple and keep it short, I guess um, my government name is Dean, my artist name is Hundo P. Um, I'm a multifaceted, multidimensional being like every person who's on this call and who is not. Uh, and I consider myself an artist. And I also wear all other hats. I'm a therapist, I'm a coach. Um, uh, I'm an activist and an organizer, um, an owner of a business and a brand, uh, just really just exploring life and um, just creating and empowering any which and every which way I can. And that's really my mission and my aim. And that's just what I try to do is empower others to live their life in whatever unique way they feel empowered to live it. Uh, and I'm very honored to be here. I'm honored to be asked to be here. Um, and I just am appreciative of uh, the fact that, you know, Brother Sean and I have had our relationship for such a long time and it's come to interesting fruition now that we're hosting this call together. So it's really dope and I'm honored. So appreciate you, my brother. And thank you very much for having me there. No doubt, man. And I just think it's it's an honor to just go back in time a little bit because I feel like I never know how we're going to come together. I just feel like if we vibe on some type of level, then it's important to just nurture the vibe where it goes. So I'm just, I'm honored to have you on as well. Um, next up, we got Brother Brandon. I see you over there. What's up, man? Tell us about yourself and what you're doing. Yeah, man. Um, my name is Brandon Reed. Uh, shoot, I guess, uh, not I guess, but I'm a business owner here in Houston, Texas. Uh, my, my own construction firm down here. Um, a little bit about me, grew up in Denver. Park Hill, East Side, I've all been around those parts. And then after that came down to, after graduating from East High, where I met Sean, the Angels, huh? The Angels. Went over to Kansas State, uh, graduated with my degree in the Bachelor's of Science in Construction Science and Management. Shortly after that, came down to South, to Houston, Texas, chasing a lady. Recently has been engaged, recently got engaged. That's something else, that's something else just happened. So, yeah, all along the way, um, kind of it's kind of a, been a, a a weird little travel, but honestly, it's just been about us working for ourselves for a long time. Me working for myself, I've I've had so much struggle working for some for working for somebody else, trying to fit those norms, trying to fit that little battle there. So I've always been about uh, black economic uh, like freedom, making sure that we have our own on our own, can be on our own sustainably, uh, economic freedom. Uh, and also just being about that spoken voice to be out there and, you know, let things be known. 
a little bit about out here when uh, the George Floyd protests were starting out on that Friday, like we were all out there. It was deep in the whole streets and everything. It was crazy, but it was a good time to be out there with the people. So uh, I am uh, excited to be on this panel with all these distinguished men, all these distinguished black men and the ally, and uh, just making sure that, you know, we convey our thoughts and listen to one another. All right, all right. B Money is in the building. <laughs> um, yeah. Next up, Brother Chris. I know we've recently connected and just based off of our conversation, I know that you're gonna bring a lot of words. Can you give us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing? Sure, uh, Chris Johnson, uh, based here out of Nashville, Tennessee, um, by way of Louisiana, born and raised in, down south. Um, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've uh, started multiple companies um, and I'm actually in the process of uh, starting up another venture here um in in the entertainment space to really kind of you know help our young uh create create creators our, our creative minds and content creators to be able to actually be able to create sustainable revenue um you know just after seeing the way that our people are being literally taken advantage of and and, I, and, and not just our people but just creatives in, in general but um also you know when sean and i We've probably known each other now probably maybe a month, but just off the conversations that we've had, I've, I, I was really um, honored that he would ask me to come on board and, and be a part of the panel um, because he touched, we just had, a, I mean, we literally had hours of conversation just talking about current affairs, but also the historical perspective of things. And I felt as though, you know, I really, in you know, would, enjoy having being a part of, of, of the conversation. And so I'm just honored and hope, hopefully I can add some value. I, I guess I'm the only gray beard on here, but uh, hopefully that, uh, <laughs> that'll help the builders. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for, so much for inviting me on here. Of course, man. And I, I don't know, I, I think, cause I had a daughter recently. So I, I, I got a few little gray hairs, you know, they, they coming one at a time it's like every night i think i see a new one but we working on it <laughs> they come fast man <laughs> <laughs> and i think brother taj he is our other guest and we're gonna wait a little bit because i think something happened with his link but no worries he has a lot of a wisdom and insight that we can learn from so we're gonna go back to brother brandon because I know there was a there were a few things that we did in college that I guess I didn't really take note of until later on. And it's really around leadership. I feel like I didn't understand leadership when we were in high school whatsoever. I wasn't a part of any organizations. I I literally just played football, went home. And then at 16, got a job, you know, worked at Elitches, you know, you know, all the bullshit. So did all the little things, but I wasn't a part of any things. And when we went to K-State, next thing you know, it's like both of us are finding our own comfort zones within our, our respective interests. So I just want to start this off by asking, like, what is Nesby? And how did it prepare you specifically to venture out as an independent black engineer working for yourself? Great question. Um, at the collegiate level and at the professional level, there's an organization called NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers. And um, my 20, I've, I've been a part of them for um, 20, 13 on some 2013 my story is a little different or well, had little trajectories with, with college i got in i was going to go play football and i was also in horticulture and animal science uh i had started playing rugby high school loved it was playing rugby in college and then i dislocated my shoulder so then i that had an effect on my college and everything and so that switched me into going from animal science to construction and then from just a whole little mindset shift so then i found that a little history, a little little insight about Kansas State is that it's a PWI, predominantly white institute. So we were trying to find a group of people that looked like us anywhere we could. So for me, that was NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers. Um, 
And I got started in that, honestly, because of the lack of leadership that I was seeing. Uh, I was seeing that there was like a pitfall, you know, not necessarily saying I could do it better. I was just saying that I could be more transparent in that role and being able to take it from where it was to somewhere better than where I wanted to see it. So that's what got me started with Nesby um, in that role. The year I was president, we went off to win five full five, five uh, awards at our nationals and regionals, uh, our nationals and regionals, which was nationals was at Boston, regionals was in Kansas City. I had uh, a number of people with me that had just really touched us and affected us in a big way because it really gave us that insight of not only do people that look like me work at NASA, work in Boeing, work in all these other high places, Hewitt, Packard, like uh, uh, GE, all these people, like not only do those people that, that look like me work there, but they're looking for more. But the thing is, it's not, it's not to be a charity case. It's gotta really be that cream of the crop to be up there. You know, there really, there are, there are no handouts when it came to it. And we were seeing that firsthand when we were being addressed with certain people that come to our, our, our meetings and our panels at the Nesbitt Nationals, at Boston and at Regionals, at Kansas City, and just seeing the wealth of knowledge they had. Like they were older people still working on their craft. Like they were masters of it, but they were still like adamantly working on it day by day. So it had a profound effect on me, especially uh, going from college to now, because I'm a part of Nesby here in the Houston area at a professional level as well. So what, do you, what are you guys doing in Houston? So uh, the Houston chapter here, we are adapting to the new normal. Everybody keeps saying, you know, like there's going to have to be, it's an organization that's really built on being a collective community of engineers. So we have people from Chevron, Exxon, people that work for the wastewater, um, uh, Houston Flood District, Harris County Flood District, a number of architects and engineers. I myself am the only entrepreneur or only uh, engineer that works for himself, but there's other ones that have other ventures, be it in real estate or in stocks. Here in Houston, we want to build that. We're, we're still growing our brand or growing our unit, but at the same time, they're very well established here in uh, called Five Deep, how deep Five Deep here in Houston in uh, or the, the uh, Region Five, and they have we have one of the most successful chapters in the professional realm as at NSB. So we're just making sure that we're visible one, um, and we have also our mission, which is to um, uplift the next generation. I, I'm forgetting the mission escapes me right now, but it's really to uplift the next generation of engineers and making sure that at the collegiate level that, uh, and that we uh, excel uh, academically and uh, excel academically and uh, it escapes me, but the, really the mantra of it is to be professional in the settings of academics and in the professional setting and being able to uh, grow our members, you know, and grow our, our whole organization. Um, right now, because of COVID, we're actually getting ready to do a, uh, a bike ride. That's something we, we feel like we can do with enough people together that we are, still have that separation, six feet and whatnot, and being able to be around each other. So it's a little different, little obstacles, but we're adapting to it. I feel that. Um, yeah, it's crazy to think about just the different types of obstacles, whether it's uh, it's an actual structure, like out in Montbello. And we, we had a conversation, what was it about two weeks ago with folks from Montbello and they actually rebuilt that bridge by Peoria and I-70. Mm -hmm. So they made the walkways a little bit just walkable. Cause I, I remember growing up, it's like I had to bike through the dirt path over there. Cause there just, there wasn't a, a sidewalk there wasn't anything that was just healthy for for people to to have transportation so mm -hmm. the more that i think about how do we build an infrastructure whether it's through our mind state or just an actual livable space like it, it's becoming more important to me so i just feel like that's something that it's overlooked you know it impacts like how we even get to our jobs, you know, our, our business commute. So just know like the more that I'm growing, the more I can actually appreciate the work that you've been doing and that you uh, made a career out of. And to follow up on that, we had a conversation recently about emotions as entrepreneurs, mm. but I want you to 
talk to me a little bit about what's it like as a black entrepreneur to feel the full spectrum of emotions and what what struggles that we face as black men in America deter us from achieving that economic and social success? All right, great question, great question. I'll, I, and I'll only speak for myself anecdotally because I'm seeing it firsthand. So for myself, I got into being an entrepreneur out of desperation. I uh, quit a job that was in last September that was incredibly toxic as much as that type of Texas culture as you can think of, it was real and I was in it. And the people that know me or Sean, you know me, like I, I can't really thrive in that type of bubble, you know? So from September to December, I was unemployed, right? However, I, I, was, I, was, but I was still working and making rent and doing what I had to do and hustle and everything, but that's just because of my, my family and my upbringing. I'm sorry if it's dark in here. Let me, let me turn on the light real quick, I'm sorry. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So it was complete desperation from September to December. I was unemployed. Uh, January, I was slanging insurance going. I was, uh, I got certified, you know, doing insurance and all that stuff. So I was, that was my next thing I was doing, but I didn't enjoy it. I didn't love it. Nothing like that. But the, all the while I had an LLC that I had purchased in 2017, 2018 to do real estate. So I was like, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that from being inactive to active. I'm gonna pay my back taxes on it. I'm gonna make sure I file those taxes that are on it, my franchise taxes. After I do that, I'm gonna go through the name change and everything to go through the process to build it to be the business that it is today. After I went through that whole process, I started to look for clients, but really I was at the gym. I was at the gym because I was trying to figure out in my head, like how am I gonna do this together? I had a game plan written down, but then it came to the application of it few of my clients actually found me. So from that point to now, the growth, I guess you can call it, or just the metamorphosis that happened, happened throughout every lane of emotion. I'm telling you, once you really start, because every, every dollar I spend, every dollar I've spent from January to today, I've went and I've, I've, I have to go pay taxes on, right? Like it's, it's a dollar I made myself. I write my own check. Right. When I go out and I, I bid on jobs, I have to make sure that I go back, not just to bid on that job, but make sure that I put a salary on it because I got to get paid too. So every single dollar that I've made this year has been, is my, I, I put it in my own pocket, really. I've made it, I put it in my own pocket and been able to deposit it, pay my taxes on it, pay back taxes, wherever it has to be, go ahead and uh, 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 get this project set out, like my website and everything, like everything that I've done, is, it's really been built up myself. And it all started from a state of desperation, but it has become what it is today throughout a learning process. And that's where the emotions came in. Every single one, right? Between fear, between agitation, between hatred, between desperate, you know, being depressed, and then the happy euphoria for when it works, right? For when it works. By me grinding this out day in and day out. And we were talking just a little bit earlier about that consistent execution level that will, that seems impossible, but that's the only way that I, I felt that I could address it, right? When you're executing at a high level for a long period of time, it, it, it some happens to your brain where there's doubt that happens saying, is this gonna work, right? Cause for a period of time, there were no checks coming. Like there was no checks coming in. There was no bills being paid. It was all back. It was all phone calls. When is we getting this bread? And I'm just like, hold on, right? Hold on. Because in my head, I already know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this work. I don't know how exactly I'm going to make it work. But it was like, I'm not going to, I can't give up. Man, I couldn't give up. I had a job offer come through um, late in spring. And it was, it was, it just reinforced that I have to keep going. It's going to suck. But like Nifty said, like, I just didn't give up. It's the same thing because the job offer I was, I was given was going to throw me right back into the whirlpool. 
and give me a reason to be like, I need to go out and start my own thing. Well, here I am in my own thing. So for me, going through all those emotions of it, it didn't really dawn on me like, oh man, I mean, you're a black man about me. I mean, I, I always know I'm black. I'm always you know, very aware of that. But the part where I was like, oh snap, is when I was in these pre-bid meetings and I'm the only one that looked like me. I'm in these pre-bid meetings. I'm going and doing site walks. I'm going and doing pre, pre-bid site walks at different schools, at different uh, uh, government facilities and at different warehouses. And I'm just like, where are we at? We weren't there. Right. And that's when it became one of those things where I, I took a step back, like, oh, snap, like I'm really black out here. Like, <laughs> like I'm really out here. I like, really getting this, getting this in like yeah, pre bid. Like real quick, can you talk to us about a pre bid? Yeah. So pre bids are so a bidding because uh, uh, it's a construction firm that I have. It's called Reed's Estimating. And so the pre bid is. Um, it allows you to ask your questions to whoever is the buyer or the owner, because I'm coming in to build whatever my scope is. So if I come and I say I'm gonna cover roofs or if I have another discipline I'm covering, it allows me the time to come in and ask those questions. And it's a good question you asked that too, Sean, because that for me, uh, being in going to Kansas State and me being going, going through the college whirlpool of death, it was really like the more prepared you are, the better off you will be later down the road. I was bringing everything to these pre-bids, my drawings, my phones. I, I was bringing everything to them because I wanted to be able to reference that when I'm asking my questions. And it was crazy to be there and see people that was asking very basic questions that you could open up the first page and be like, okay, there's my answer. And they wouldn't be able to have that. They didn't have that separation between their preparation and being there and being up front and being professional to make sure we're moving the ball, you know? So that's one of the things like the, that's what the pre-bid is pretty much. You come to it, you're asking your technical questions so that you can get clarification when you go back and present your, your proposal to bid on the project. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Okay. And I, I'm sorry, I kind of like interjected that because I was just naturally curious because I feel like it's very easy for us to, to get discouraged. But one thing that you were talking about is just like that full spectrum of emotion. Yeah. Uh, did you want to conclude that thought? Yes, I will say that just like you would in like the habits, like, and, and don't quote me on this, but I heard this a while back is a sort of a sleep, a sleep study where you want to finish your REM sleep, right? If you, it's really hard for you to wake up in the middle of it. But if you finish out the dream, you finish out the dream and you're done with that and you can wake up. The, and, I, and I relate that to emotions because you're going to go through them all. You're never going to stop and be like, I'm just happy I'm getting my money, I'm cool. Because you got to get ready for tax season, right? Quarterly taxes was just concluded, what, to, what yesterday, right? Extended from April. Okay, if you didn't have your 2019 taxes done and you're and you're a business and you're like, okay, I got to get these uh, quarterly taxes done, like, no, 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 scoop back, do 2019, get those completed and then get your quarterly on because there will be an audit, right? So that's my mindset all the time was just, you're going to go through every single one. You're going to touch them again. You're going to touch them again. I've gone through the process of bidding a project, winning a project, building the project, going through and subbing that project out, getting paid from the project, right? Having like the fattest check I've ever seen in my life. Fattest check I've ever seen in my life. Like, oh, this is real, this is working. After that, cut that bad boy in half. Why? Because I got to pay the subs. Cut that bad boy again in half. Why? Because I got to pay the taxes on the money. So you're going to go through a whole spectrum of it. And just to feel it out, get comfortable with every single one of those because it, it comes and it goes, each emotion, each emotion. But I still advocate for every single person. If you can and if you're in your capabilities to do so in your knowledge base, go work for yourself. Huh? Make yourself a few dollars and go work for yourself. Brandon, if I if I may interject and just ask a question for you and yes. get, you, get your insight on this here because um, as an entrepreneur myself, um, let me get your take on dealing with 
other people working under you, whether they're subs or, or whether they're employees and getting them to understand the, all of those different emotions and all of those different aspects that come with being the head of a business that they don't necessarily see. Mm-hmm. And, you know, can you speak kind of to some of those experiences that you had? And I, I've, I've had quite a few, but I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's great to have this dialogue with you too, because you, I guess I'm talking about it, you've been through it type of thing, but it's, it's, it's cool. Um, I will tell you this, and if anyone's out there that knows me personally, and Sean does, is like this, how I'm talking now, this is, this is me, but you see my name is Brandon, right? So when I showed up on site, they said, um, who are you? I said, I'm Brandon. No, 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 we're waiting for Brandon to be here. I was like, I am, that is me, right? That is me. When you're on these job sites and you look like me and they're not expecting that and you have one of these names that just looks like you can slap it on anybody and just show up, the first thing you, because because perception is, the, is, perception is uncontrollable in other people's minds. That's what I've learned. Because at first glance, they're going to make whatever it is that, the assumption as they're seeing them. Then from that, that's where you have to build. So that emotion comes in when you're dealing with other different subs because they are at a whole nother place in their mind. Doesn't matter how many, how many, I ran into this with my project I finished. They've been doing this gig for 20, 30 some odd years, right? They swear they're the best, best professional out of I'm sure you are, I'm sure you are. But what you need to do is understand that I need to report these payments I'm giving you back to DMV. You need to be reporting these, all these projects and all these invoices that I'm doing for you all these change orders, you need to report those back to the credit bureau so that you and I both get credit for doing this job. But see, they didn't understand that. And that's when the jealousy sets in. As I'm, even as I'm paying these gentlemen, right? I was, as I'm paying them and thousands of dollars just to make sure that I'm, because of this is the amount of money that I expect out, right? I'm handing them their checks and they're like, oh, Okay, yeah, here's your money, right? This is the amount of money that we got agreed on. Here it is, right? Then it becomes a, uh, well, and this is what I ran into just this last time. He said, well, why don't you make the check out to me? No, sir, I, I'm doing business with an LLC. I'm doing business with a person who's supposed to have a tax number. So what I'm not gonna do is put you in a, uh, put you and myself in a position where we can't be audited and defend ourselves. Oh, well, you think you know everything because you went to college. Ah, jealous, right? Now me, at first, when there's animosity, I just answer it with animosity, right? And, and, I, and I've been working on this myself. I answer aggression with aggression. Like, we, do we have a problem? Is there something wrong here? Is there, do we have a problem? And it's like, no, nah, no, nah, man, I mean, I just wanted to, I wanted to know why why you can't just just issue this to me and not to, and not to the business like sir you're supposed to have a whole business whether you have one or not this check is made out to one because i covered my bases right now we gone over jealousy and there was a little bit of hate in the beginning and now it comes back to a little bit of more envy and then the confusion because then i'm saying something they don't necessarily say and so they default to something saying like you think you know everything Right. You can't control the spectrum of emotions that whoever you're working with is going through because you're not going to be dialing on the same tune. And that's where there's other friction that comes in, too. And so it's really like it's tough. There's there's no silver bullet for it. It really is tough. I'm learning myself right now. And what I'm finding out is that being able to at least control my own emotions will give me a better outcome than me answering to whatever level they're at. But what I'm not going to stand for is any type of disrespect because we both men, as soon as we came into this discussion, we're going to leave out as professionally as possible. We're going to know where we stand together. So it's, I'm learning. I'm learning, sir. I'm learning, Chris. I'm learning, man. Hey, I feel you, man. It, it, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's. I want to, Brandon, do you mind ask it, if I ask a follow-up question about that? Go ahead. <laughs> I'm curious because... I'm curious if you ever find yourself feeling like you need to manage the emotions of the people that you are managing, or do you kind of like, or is it kind of like, let the emotions run the course for the people you're, that are working for you? 
Good question. I'll tell you what I've done, like, and uh, and it will sound however it is going to sound. But this is just what I've done, and I've seen uh, it work in that instance. There, there came up something during a project that they said they wanted to going to issue. They were they were going to issue me a change order, and I was like, you can't really issue me a change order on this work when it's not to come. I have to sell this work that you put up. And the only reason I can sell this to the owner because the owner is going to collect, is going to be able to sign off on this because they want it to be to the code, right? So at that point, he had got upset and then he just starts exploding through the mouth. Nah, man, I'm trying to tell you how to do this. You don't know how this is going. You don't know how this is and everything else is going. And he was like, you know, I'm trying to let you know something because Brandon, you don't know. My response, okay. Right. I'm going to let if that's the case, because at this point, and let me give you backstory on the job I was doing. It was in San Antonio. I'm in Austin. I'm driving three hours a day back and forth two weeks. And I'm serious about making this break. So at the same time of me being exhausted, driving down these highways and by roads, like I'm still going to make sure I'm getting this quality out of them because I'm paying for it. Right? I'm not going to allow them to, to shortchange myself, get my, my money and then messing up my reputation. So when they started to like get really agitated and to get really beside themselves, I just had to manage it for them. You mad? All right. You know, that's how I was attacking those, those realms because I had, to out, so I had to do these mental juke moves to make sure that as smart as they are, what they don't know is how I'm doing my thing in the back end of it. Doesn't mean they necessarily need to know. We just have to get this job done so that everybody gets paid and goes home. So for me personally, like running into other people's emotions and, and how it comes in, if I can let them think that they're telling me something that I don't know, that's gonna control the outcome of how we're gonna be able to get to a base with this conversation, right? So they come at me with aggression. Brandon, I gotta tell you something you don't know. Go ahead. By all means, they get done telling me the whole thing. Just like, okay. And at the same time, they're still working. I'm not signing a change order. We're getting done with the job on time and everybody's getting paid. Well, it's kind of amazing to have that level of emotional control in that situation. Cause I'm, I'm sure I would feel fucking livid um, just hearing that. Um, yeah, it, uh, it took some, and Sean can tell you where I'm at is not where I started. <laughs> Where I'm at is not where I started. It, it, it took definitely a learning process for me to just know that like, even though I will meet the aggression level, it's not always worth it. Not yeah. always. And it speaks to the discipline you were talking about just to start the business, to go through it, to, yeah, just everything. Um, and to switch gears, um, I'm wondering if we can get Hundo P to jump in here. Um, could you kind of talk more about your art, um, your practice. I know you recently graduated from Naropa. Yeah, um, I guess, uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. And uh, yeah, Brandon, I appreciate you being real, man, because that's something that people are not, they are not real, so thank you, man. Um, uh, let's see, talk about myself, cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, man, yeah, I, as far as my art, man, uh, I'm a visual artist, a vocal artist, a musician, um, a painter. Uh, you know, I do any form of art, uh, create digital art. Uh, I have been creating music since I can remember, since I was young. Uh, I was in choir, things like that as a young child. Um, and I was very fortunate to play college sports and to play a little bit of sports after college. And for me, art has always been what I really wanted to do and who I really felt like I was, who I was. And so I released the project three years ago now uh, with a friend of mine who I originally came out to Colorado to work with. I'm from Southwest Florida, Fort Myers to be exact. Um, so came out to Colorado after my undergraduate work to pursue art, to pursue business, life, uh, coach, um, things of that nature. Uh, when I say coach, I coach snowboarding. Um, and um, so for me, art has always been an outlet. And so you mentioned that I recently graduated from Naropa. And so at my time at Naropa, I was you know, creating music, creating different art forms. Uh, and then after graduation, um, 
I really sort of allowed my art to ex expand and, and um, continue, it continues to grow every day. And it's, I feel like it's still so young. Uh, I still feel like I'm pretty young in my uh, young adult life. So right now, um, the biggest thing that I would say is I'm releasing music every 20th of the month. And that's kind of something that I find very um, unique and, and uh, something that really speaks to me personally. It gives me a particular goal. Uh, and also it allows me to, like I said, I create everything. I didn't say this, but I'm saying this now. I create everything from the beginning to the end of the process. So the production, the mixing, the mastering, the creating of the cover, the creating of the video, the video itself. Um, kind of wild to try to shoot yourself by the way so there's always a part where you know you have to collaborate which is always fun uh, and then ultimately that comes out uh, to be a, a, mu a musical project and then also uh, I have different art pieces so that's my musical side my art side is uh, like I said I'm a painter and I create different visual art whether it be um, through media digital media and or um, various mediums uh, so I've been doing a lot of acrylic painting uh, with the current just situation that we've all been in uh, and, and various organiz organizations that I've been a part of or organizing events that I've done. Uh, I was pulled to really create certain types of painting. So I've been painting a lot of flags with, um, you know, power fists or joint flags with power fists, really just to echo uh, the unity of, of Black people. Uh, I personally feel that uh, we if, if more time than never, it's time to get back to, to our history and what we really are and really get deep and down into it. Uh, and we've been divided and, and, and dropped all across the world. And yet at the same time, we're still black. Melanin's melanin. Uh, and so I think for me, what I've been able to paint recently has been able to echo where, where I feel I'm at and where I've been at in my young life and as an artist. Um, and then I think that takes me into my practice and, and just what I do uh, in the therapeutic realm and field. And I say that it funnels into it because I tell people and I empower people to do what they want to do in life. And yet you, you know, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. So you can tell somebody to do something in a space or an office or whatever setting. Uh, but for me, it's what are you doing in your daily life? Are you living these words or are you just doing or and saying these things because they sound good for other people? Um, so in graduating Naropa, it's given me the opportunity to open a private practice and just given me a, the credential to do so. I've been doing therapeutic and counseling work for up, oh, I would say, I would say six or seven years with, with particularly adolescents, young people, uh, predominantly young men of color is, is the demographic of my, I think, personal just enjoyment and where I'm pulled to and my purpose in a way. Um, because it's what you know what Brandon was speaking to I think what Chris is also speaking to what it seems like I'm hearing a lot is ownership is key and I'm very much a, a proponent of that uh, I think there's power in ownership and there's power in um, ownership of yourself and your mind we're talking about emotional regulation and I think that's such a, a, a big part of life especially as we get older and develop as people um, and our our qualities are, are all beautiful and unique. And at the same time, how can we incorporate them and, and, and help them fuel us and, and, and boost us to the places we want to go rather than have them um, because of the, the way that our world is structured in this particular moment? Um, how are we our own worst enemy and how do, our, how do we hold ourselves back? So um, for me, that's how my art and my therapy comes together. Uh, and, and ultimately, that's just a little bit about me. But ultimately, that was a lot about me. So yeah, I appreciate the time and the space. And thanks for listening yeah yeah um i smiled because i wasn't sure if you were going to stop naming like incredible impressive hobbies that you were off you're like snowboarding <laughs> college athlete psychotherapist yeah. Yeah. um that's fucking awesome thanks man appreciate that been uh been fortunate in life man yeah you talked a little bit about like your paintings and you talked about working with like men of color or young people of color in your uh, practice. I'm curious if you can like speak more to that and like what your goals are. You talked a little bit about ownership um, and just like the kind of impact you want to make through all those mediums. Well, I think it's simple for me. It's, uh, it's to empower. It's to empower people to, to do what it is that they want to do. And it's also to empower people to to learn more. I think uh, Nas said it best, read more, learn more, grow. Uh, and, not, and, and reading is such a, it's a, 
if I just want to say that I really, not as a therapist, but as a human, I despise the word privilege. I think it really alludes to something that we are less than or more than each other. So I like the word access. So I'm going to just say that to say this, um, reading is an access point, right? Not everybody is allowed to learn how to read traditionally in this world. So when I say reading is power, I say that as a, as a person who has access to knowing how to read. So I say that with a lot of gentleness because I have access to certain things. However, I do feel that we can all be taught things. Um, and I think that we can learn and we can grow and we can teach each other because ultimately when you read, you're just reading somebody else's thoughts. Um, so what I hope to do is empower people to learn more in their own way. And I hope I empower people to read more because I think reading is such a lost art. Um, and it sounds silly, but I don't think we read as much as we used to. Um, there's so much studies on how even we read because we read on the internet and we read on TV screens and things like that. We only read portions of things. It's so funny how we just peruse. And we're, it's, it's pretty amazing actually as humans how we're even able to process information without reading all of it. And yet I also think that that speaks to how we rush the process. And I say that to say that I work with young people and what I hope to do with young people is just to help teach them that there's a process. And no matter how crazy that the world gets or how crazy life gets, because we cannot really control much that is outside of our bodies and what is in our bodies sometimes. And even that is uncontrollable at, at times. Um, we have the power and we have the control. So what I just hope to do is just shift the power back to the people uh, and just make them realize that they are the, the answers that they seek or they are the blessings that they, uh, you know, wish to, to be bestowed upon them. Um, it's in every action. It's in every word. It's in everything we do or don't do. Um, so long, long answer long is, you know, I just hope to empower people to return back to their roots and in returning back to their roots, I hope they're empowered to um, empower themselves. And so really, I think it's a ripple effect. You empower other people. If you feel good, you're going to help other people feel good. Um, Deion Sanders said, if you look good, you play good, you play good, you get paid good. So, um, and I'm from Fort Myers, Florida. So that's, you got to rep, you know, baby. So, um, and I just, I say that to say you are what you are. Um, and, uh, I think I just want to empower people to be what they are, um, and to find what that is because I think that's part of the process is to go through the emotional waves and things that, you know, Brandon spoke to earlier on the business side. I think that's just a life side too. Business is just a reflection of life. Life is a reflection of business. Um, so that's what I'll say to that. Appreciate the question, man. Undo P, I love how you just bring up all these different sources of inspiration, whether it's Deion Sanders, or I, we all see that guy in the background, Bob Marley. So, you know, that's that's just that's something that it, it flows through us. You know what I mean? Like the Buffalo Soldier, like we all have this get up and go to a degree, but then there's also this sense of shame when it comes to starting our own. And I'm curious if you'd be willing to speak a little bit about how did you handle shame like growing up and how do you coach young people now to, to handle their own shame as, as uh, black boys or boys of color? Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna try to condense this. So let me organize my thoughts. Um, first and foremost, man, I'm an Afro-Caribbean, you know, black man. So um, there was a whole debate on my whole life on what was my identity, who am I? That's why I speak so much to knowing your roots um, because it wasn't until later in life that I realized that we are who we are. And I say that to say melanin is melanin, like I said earlier. Um, and so to me, the first part of that is just identifying yourself and at least just it's, we have to accept and come into understanding and, and love for our own bodies and for our own abilities. It's not even just bodies, just ability to breathe. Um, so I encourage young people first and foremost to be, um, and when you're dealing with shame, you're dealing with not only shame that is your own, you're dealing with a societal shame, you're dealing with, there's levels to it, right? Um, and not to give a therapy session here, but, you know, that's what we're speaking to, right? Is we're dealing with an emotion that is, is the shadow. It's, it's something that we don't talk about. And then when it comes up, we push it down or we don't express it. 
Um, so I think if one, if you're willing to kind of be in your body a little bit, there's that piece. So the being part, the second piece is, okay, once I'm in my body a little bit, I'm willing to accept and willing to say, Hey, there's shame here. Wow. There's a lot. There's, you know, shame hurts. Shame's heavy. Um, as a young person, what did I do? I acted out. I didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, that's why I do what I do now. Um, because I wasn't taught certain things. I was taught that shame wasn't good or anger was bad. Or if you express shame or anger, you're fitting a certain mold or an image or, or what have you, or you're hurting people or this and that. Um, and in reality, all of those things are true. And you're also hurting yourself by not expressing it um, and by keeping it all in. So there's being, I think there's just coming into who you are and just maybe just identifying this body, this immortality. And then there's the piece around um, just feeling it, being it, expressing it. And then the last part is uh, just knowing that it comes and it goes, it flows. I think Brandon spoke to that earlier. It's um, he did this motion and I just feel waves are so real, man. Water is everything. I think Bruce Lee said, you know, be water, my friend, right? So um, it is being aware that it's going to come and it's going to go. Uh, and as a young person, it's going to come and go a lot <laughs> because you're dealing with a lot. Uh, and as an adult, I think it maybe even comes up even more, but you just learn, or maybe we think we learn to deal with it, or maybe we just shove it down. That's a di bigger discussion for a, a different day, right? Um, however, I think for me, it's those three things. So maybe coming into awareness of this body type of thing, um, then it's maybe allowing that to be in the body and saying, wow, this is an emotion. It's an experience. An emotion is an energy in motion. So it's, it's, let's, let's be okay with it being there. Uh, and then it's expressing it or moving it or allowing it to, to, to move, as, as, I've, as I've said, allowing it to come as it's gone and go as it's come. Uh, so, and then, and with young people, I think the coolest way and the biggest way to do that, and I think the, where you see it a lot is we push a lot of young people down from doing certain things because we're afraid of their outcome because, well, they're some, you know, they don't have a prefrontal cortex, so they don't think about certain things, right? And yet there's beauty and risk. And so it's encouraging young people to take healthy, positive risks. And it's also encouraging them to be aware that there's negative, unhealthy risks that have consequences, just as the positive ones as well, and that those can help become better aware of the positive ones. Um, that's part of learning. That's part of life. It's, it's, it's fueling and it's letting them understand that mistakes are okay uh, and that if you're making mistakes, you're learning. It's not losses, they're lessons. So that's what I'll say to that question. I appreciate you. Of course. And Hundo P, I, I appreciate how you concluded that. It's not losses, it's lessons. And I want to I wanna piggyback some of what you were talking about, especially as it relates to reading and how we might feel. And I'm going to transition to Chris because Chris recently started an enterprise which I am actually participating in. And I would love it if we could have Chris speak a little bit about that, that empowerment as it relates to artistry, knowing that a lot of our young men strive to be artists, especially black men. Like, I don't, I mean, I've been rapping since 16 and Brandon can tell you that. Like I, I started off as Shawnee D and I went through all these processes where I didn't know myself. I had no fucking clue who Sean was. So I had to go through a lot of pain. I wanted to talk about things, but I was coming from the basement mentality. You know, it's like, well, should I want, I want to say something, but I'm going to say it in the basement. And now we got guys like Chris who literally helped develop and nurture the, the artistic mind. I won't say the young mind, but I, the, the artistic mind. So Chris, can you, talk to us a little bit about what you're starting and you know what what's significant about EKG as it relates to self-empowerment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just want to elaborate on a couple of things that, that Honda even uh, spoke on. And, you know, um, I, it's refreshing to hear that, you know, you have multiple streams because, you know, music has been ultimately devalued to, and that artistry, you know, I, my background, I'm trying to set, it, set it some context here. So, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough or blessed enough to have experienced both sides of the, of the, of the um, spectrum, um, you know, 20 plus years 
in the the corporate environment and and understanding the, that that whole mantra i was able to you know excel in it but not lose myself within it um and stay true to my roots but all that goes back to you know what i found to be so healthy about what we're doing tonight is having those strong mentors there to guide me um you know it was it was my first real mentor was my former father-in-law who actually got me into technology and got me into that space. So I, I got to come up through the whole dot-com errors and things like that and got more and more additional mentors that taught me about, you know, running your own businesses and starting your own businesses. And, and I got to go through the whole transition with the music space when things were all shifting from, you know, all these big monolithic analog studios where you have you know the 80 channel consoles and all these things like that but then things got shifted with the digital space and it went through through it through a transition period there where you know the record companies didn't know what to do they they, they were losing money fist to cuffs because they didn't know what to do with all this technology but then you know you have these these large technology companies that came in and they literally um came in and created a these platforms that ultimately devalued the music and the, the artist's ability to make money off of their content even far worse than what the large labels were already previously doing. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I talk to things such as, I know we're broadcasting on Facebook, but you have, you know, platforms such as YouTube, Spotify, and all of these platforms and you know when they create their platforms their platforms were diametrically opposed to artists making money that that is not their business model their business model is to make people become the product um you know it's like artists go out they create their content they're literally investing in billion dollar companies with no return on it i mean and i and i always tell artists i, I say you know hey how much money when we have these conversations with artists i say well what's your goal and and nine out of ten of them say well i want to get a million streams on youtube and i'll say okay so you want to get a million streams on youtube what's the end game well if i get a million streams on youtube i get clout and you know hopefully i'll make some money and i'm like and i'm like okay well how much money have you invested in in your career and they'll say, oh, thousands of dollars. And, and this, and I say, how much money have you made off all these videos that I've seen you post on? You got, you got videos on YouTube. And I mean, literally, you got people that have hundreds of thousands of views and haven't made a thousand bucks yet. Or you got tens of thousands of followers on Instagram and you haven't made a hundred bucks. And it's like, okay. So throughout, throughout my career, you know, I've, 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 I've actually been granted several patents over the last, last 10 years. So I took my background in technology, took my love of music, and really as my, our, my wife and I, our, our two youngest kids got ready to graduate, it was like, okay, I want to get back into the music, but I don't want to just go back into the same old model of starting an a, a independent record label and chasing after a contract. I just knew that wasn't what I wanted to do, so I started understanding and breaking down a real monetization strategy for helping independent artists to literally make money off of their content. And so that's where the, the whole concept of EKG came about. It's, it's, it's really, um, the name is really, it, it has meaning um, and it's about empowering artists to be able to understand the dynamics that they're working against and actually helping put them into a position to leverage these large platforms and actually help them to make money from it. So, you know, it's like, hey, if you, if, if you, if you got, if I'm coming in and partnering with you and I'm telling you, don't rush out here to go get a recording contract. Let, in fact, I've been blessed enough. I'll go and we'll do a joint venture together. You invest in yourself, I'm investing in you. We're gonna create a joint venture. I have this platform that I've developed on this platform, we're going to be, create content, put the content on the platform, and then we're going to leverage all of your followers. So whether they're friends, followers, subscribers, or whatever they are that's on all these big mega, mega platforms, and let's convert those followers into supporters. And, 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 I, and I use that word supporters 
for a reason because people that support you will pay you for your worth and for your value because they truly support what you're doing. And so it's, let's go out here and turn, if you've got 50,000 Instagram followers, let's say we convert 10% of them to supporters. And if they were willing to pay five bucks for, to watch your video on YouTube and vote for your video to be what we call a top vibe, and it's, and it's, and it's playing with five or six other videos. And so now you're getting paid. So if we convert that, and if you got six videos, six people with followers, and you got people that, that let's say those six people combined have a total of a, 100,000 followers and we convert those followers. So now you got 10,000 followers that you convert to pay five bucks a piece. That's $50,000 in revenues. Okay. Now, if that's the case, then so now you're literally in a situation to where your content can get played on a platform. And because the money that's coming in is directly meant to go to help pay for your content being on the platform. So that is really what Empower Creative is about. It's about helping artists to be able to create sustainable revenues because don't get it confused. YouTube wants you to have a million views. Instagram wants you to have 200,000 followers because their business model is they want all those people to advertise to. So they're not in the business of paying you for your content. They want all that content. They want you to have that influence, but they don't want you to pay for it. They don't want to pay you for it. And our, our whole business model is based on turn, don't be blind and think that all of those people are true supporters. Some of them are just, they're, they're just followers. And some of them are bots and all these other things. But ultimately, if you can find that those, those set of followers that are really truly supporters, they will pay you for your work and you can make a living off of these things and don't fall for the, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, don't fall for the okie doke. Um, you know, I've, I've been blessed to a point to where I, I tell people all the time, you know, if I didn't really care about it so much, and I, and, I, and I do it because I care about more specifically our people, because we are the most creative people on this planet, and we come up and we've been getting it's just used fist to cuffs every generation every generation we're being used up thrown away and you know and it's just like when will we get to a situation and when will someone that's in a position actually make a change and really do something to actually try and change it rather than just going out here and say hey, i'm gonna start another record company sign some people up go give them a bad deal and then Put them right back in the same situation and and, and I, I i could go on for hours talking about this stuff and i, and I won't because it's um i'm quite sure you guys can pick up on my passion on it but that you know that's the crux of ekg is it's really about empowering artists and creative types to really be able to again get into ownership create your own production company create your own publishing company and then you can go out and you can get your own money there are certain things that these artists don't even realize that certain things even though you may be signed up with bmi but there are certain things that you have to sign up as a company similar to what brandon was saying you can be an individual but there are things that you have to have a company to be set up as to even participate and get that revenue and most of these people don't even know those things and no one's actually telling them that because they're worrying about their own pockets and their own self-interest so for me it wasn't about my self-interest in music because I don't need the music to make it. I, I care more about building a platform and creating something that's going to help create more people that can own something. Unfortunately, we are just a, we are, we've become just a bunch of consumers and we're not owning anything. And, 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 and that frustrates me. I grew up in Louisiana and, and this is, it bothers me so much because in, in my hometown, now they banned segregation in schools in the fucking, excuse my language, in the 60s. Do you know it was 1981 
they have to come in and federally mandate integration for the schools. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe integration was the best and worst thing that could happen to black people because I think it, it, it lulled us into 30 years of complacency. But it's just the idea of 20 plus years of something that was mandated. I literally remember as a kid going in a fucking cotton field with my grandmother. So to me, it's not about money. It's not about clout. It's about, again, I think Hondo said it best, getting back to your recent understanding that we don't need to just be lost consumers out here. So I'll pause on that and, and kind of get my, myself back together. But go ahead. Hey, it's, it's no worries, Brother Chris. Um, what I, I had a question, if I could, real quick. Oh, you got it, Brandon? What's up? Uh, can you talk about the day where you decided to do your own thing? How'd you feel? Like that day when you were like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and quit from here and do me now. You know what's funny though, and, and 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 again, I've been blessed to be able to be in a position. I'll put it like this here: I've been in, put, put in a position to literally where I I can actually do my own thing, and I'm still in a situation to where I'm today. I still provide strategic advice and consulting to Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies. You know, and I and I and I'll, I'll move from one to the next. I go in, I say, hey, they'll tell me what they need to do. I'll go and I'll, I'll spend two or three years working for them, and 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 it and it and I, honestly, that was the the blessing that allowed me to be able to fund these projects. Um, so it, it it was it was kind of like I say two sides of the coin, um, but ultimately I, I see EKG as being that one that could ultimately allow me to to kind of walk away from the, that that side of things. I got grandbabies now, so you know I'm I'm looking at that and you know wanting to spend time spend time with with the grandbabies and. You know, our kids are, growing, you know, in college and doing their thing. So I'm, I'm looking more uh, at it from that perspective. As, as you get older, you value your time so much more and, and you know, you, you can't get it back. But, um, you know, it's great, been a great, great, great situation. What I really appreciate and just for transparency, this, this is the first all black male uh outside of danny of course but <laughs> in terms of panelists uh this is the first all black male discussion that we've had and you guys have answered between chris and brandon and, and hundo like you guys have asked each other's questions unwarranted and i think that that natural curiosity and that natural desire is something that i really love because I feel there's so many times where like as black men, we seem to see each other as rivals as opposed to potential people who can be assets in our lives that this is just unique for me to observe, you know, like you guys really facilitating your own curiosity. And I just, I wanted to just share that thought with you guys because it, it means a lot to me in this moment. And uh, for the sake of time, I want to get to Brother Taj because he recently experienced some um, some violence within the Denver community or Aurora community, and I would love it, Brother Taj, if you could speak a little bit about your experience and what happened, and what are you doing to heal yourself? Because I know you you have been through a traumatic event, which everybody in the audience will hear about, including the panelists. But you know what? What are you doing to heal yourself from the incident, and you know just what happened? And you're on mute, by the way. So you're still on mute. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, first, let me apologize and, and beg your pardon. Um, I was on my way to another appointment at the beginning of this event. And so my intention was, of course, to be here the whole time. Um, but I appreciate um, all of my brothers who have spoken, um, who have spoken poignantly um, and so eloquently about some very important issues. So it's an honor to be here. Um, 
I, you mentioned about my mask, you know, for COVID, I also wear it for cosmetic reasons because I went through uh, the, 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 the event that you talked about uh, right at the end of May, I was shot, I was attacked uh, in what I think is a, 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 an attempt at robbery. And I was shot five times. Um, the first bullet uh, entered my head and went out my neck and uh, hit my carotid artery and I had a stroke. Uh, the other bullets um, went into my arms and my shoulder and broke broke my arm. And um, so I had a, basically my whole face shattered and my teeth shot out. So I, I tend to wear the mask now, not just because of COVID, <laughs> but it just right now until I get some more surgery and some actually dental surgery, I tend not to want to, you know, uh, look like a hippopotamus when I'm talking. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's what happened. I was able, I was in the hospital since the end of May. I got out about uh, a week and a half ago. So my recovery was very quick um, because fortunately, at least my initial injuries weren't, uh, did not put me on the brink uh, of life and death. Uh, uh, thankfully. So I now just have some, the effect of the event is, of course, I have a shattered face, so I'm just healing up bone-wise. My arm, my broken arm is also healing. The effect of my so I can, you know, it's pretty uh, dexterous, but it has no feeling at all. And the skin is really, my nerves on my skin is really affected. So I actually wear a glove because if I touch something, uh, the reaction up my arm is really, really bad. So uh, I deal with a numbness and slight paralysis. And hopefully um, as I continue with my physical therapy, um, that will also come back. And so your question about when I'm doing the heal, I think it has a couple of answers. One, to be quite honest, my my comeback was pretty fast, faster than the doctors expected. And I think this just due from a lot of just the support that I've gotten from the community and family and friends. And, and it's just been ridiculous in, in the amount of it and just how deep it was. Uh, I was able to, at least for now, especially, um, really just kind of go home and sit back and rest. I've been I've been sleeping more than I've ever had in a regular basis. I get I am able I'm able to can you am I good? Can you hear me? Okay. Um I'm able to get like 10 8 to 10 hours of sleep. I never had that. Um my life was very busy and um you know uh my my life was very busy and um i just been fortunate to just rest i uh, and, and and i'm in a situation now where i just um i still am busy with work i i i continue to work i go back to work monday and um i i just it's just a lot of rest and a lot of support um people always check in in with me um, I have friends that take me anywhere I want to go. I don't drive now because actually another thing, my left eye is actually partially blind, mostly blind, actually. So I'm not going to get out on the street and uh, risk myself or risk anyone else driving. But I have people that drive me everywhere and just check in and take, you know, take care of me. Um, but I also have an attitude that um, because I didn't die, I'm not going to act like it. And so I continue to do, you know, I continue to work. I, I work out. I, I uh, am a trainer. I, I uh, competed and trained in jujitsu and MMA for quite a while. And I'm a boxing trainer. So I went right back to that as quickly. As I went right back to that. Uh, again, work. I, I continue to kind of check in with work. I work as a um, care manager and a project director for Second Chance Center, where we provide services for those coming home from incarceration, uh, top, top to bottom services from housing to um, job search and all of those things needs to have some assistance in, in getting a life of fulfillment. And that 
sort of sense of duty is another thing that helps me heal because coming back to life and coming back to work and all of those things have always been fulfilling to me while I was doing it. And so it has helped me sort of not feel alienated and alone because those are things that, of course, are detriments to healing in and of itself. So I've just been fortunate um, with the support that I've gotten, fortunate that I didn't have worse injuries, fortunate that I'm still here. And the gratitude is what also another probably large component about, you know, the things that are helping me recover. Brother Taj, I just, I really appreciate you letting us in. And I, I feel like I owe a little bit of an explanation to Facebook Live and even the panelists as to why we would jump right into what happened with you. And I just feel I wanted to honor the fact that you didn't even have to be here, you know, and all of us are going through different struggles right now, but I know you were actually at a protest uh, prior to that accident. And we all have our reasons. Like Brandon mentioned that he was at some of the protests out in Houston. Um, we're, we're all faced with some difficult decisions and how we are going to execute what I would just see is self-love. You know, how are we gonna love one another as black people? And how can we get other people of other nationalities and races genders, et cetera, how can we get one another to just appreciate us existing? Because for so long, it seemed as if we were disposable and yeah. it still seems that we are disposable. But when I talk with men such as yourselves, I realize we're way more than disposable. We are, we're fighters, you know what I mean? In every sense of the word, like I've, <laughs> I've seen a Brandon get into a fight. Like I've seen some shit, you know what I mean? And there's a beautiful lesson in being able to fight for ourselves, whether that's economically, socially, or for our lives. You know what I mean? There's, there's something beautiful about that that I don't feel anybody can take away. So Brother Taj, uh, we're going to go in the reverse order with this one. And I, I really do appreciate you for letting us in on your story. Sure. But what do you feel that we we need to be focusing on as black men for the community and the way this the way i see this question is i'm addressing it to brother taj but after brother taj speaks if anybody else wants to chime in i would love for you guys and your input but what what do we as black men need to do for our black communities respectively in your opinions um the first thing, and this is something that Hondo already touched on. First thing is we have to learn our history. We have to learn our cultural history, our racial history, and even our national history here in this country. Because it is, while it may be difficult to get that information because, you know, we have not had people really recording it and we've had people disposing of it, it's there. And that history will bring about a sense of purpose. If you know where you came from, if you know who you are, then that creates a sense of purpose, which then allows you to uh, achieve what you want to achieve as you walk forward. The other thing, I'm gonna maybe add something that may be unexpected. We gotta learn anger management. Because as fighters, we are fighters by nature, but we fight with violence and anger. That Those two things go together. Any type of fighting that you do will have a component of violence, and that component comes with anger. That anger is as much of a drug as alcohol. I call it the other A word because it's as addicting as anything else. And we have to learn to manage that because that becomes an, an obstacle to the things that we want to accomplish. We have had abuse and violence perpetrated on us. And then we have learned that that's the way to be powerful. And therefore we carry 
not only a warrior spirit, but we carry one that's violent and very angry. And we're not necessarily as aware of that as we should be. So I think we have to learn to the man, each one of us that are on this panel, every black man that's listening to this on Facebook Live, we have to learn to manage the anger that we have inherited and that we compartmentalize and carry like on a backpack, in a backpack. We have to learn to manage that because it's a burden. And I can tell you that from personal experience. The other thing is something that you touched on yourself. And uh, it's about love, it's about self-love because the product of centuries of chattel slavery and white superiority and, and taught inferiority, inferiority creates a self-hate and a low, low, low self-worth. And so the radical hate that we've been perpetrated with must be countered with radical love. We have to learn to love ourselves to the point that we allow each other to live in a respectful manner simply because we're black. I, I, I worked for Barack Obama as a, uh, I, was a, I worked in market research for over a decade and I worked as a political strategist. And so I worked for Obama. I love this policies. I helped design this policies. And I promoted those policies and said, you should vote for him for A, B, C, and D. But I'm gonna tell you the truth about this. Personally, I only voted for Barack for one reason. Nothing that he said, nothing that he did. I voted for him because he was black and I made no apologies for saying that because I would get all kinds of reactions like, no, you should vote for the best candidate, blah, 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 blah. I voted for him for one thing because I looked at him and I had a love for him and a hope for him so deep that he had my vote with no question. We have to carry that and spread that idea that just because I see you and you look like me, you look exactly like me, brother. <laughs> your skin complexion is the same as mine. Your history is the same as mine. Your worries, your fears, your hopes and dreams, they're a reflection of exactly who I am. So if I see you and I see me, I should be in love with you to the point where I respect your life, yo. Where I don't want to rob you, where I don't want to cheat you, where I don't want to stop you from achieving your goals. Even if I'm envious, I should love you with a radical love because we've had radical hate for 500 years, over 500 years, and it's still swirling. So we have to implement the idea that just for the sake of your skin color and who you are, that I'm going to respect and love you enough to not hurt and stop you from doing what you can do and growing into what you can grow. Once we are able to put those things in place, I mean, I think about this. We clown each other, right? Ben Carson, Stacey Dash, Coons, Candace Owens. Like, what the hell are they doing? Well, we have to have a love to say, you know what? I might think that what you're doing is really messed up. I might think what you're doing is dumb as hell. You're pandering to white people. You're pandering to white superiority to make money and get clout for no reason because it's unnecessary. But guess what? I can celebrate Ben Carson and what he did to become a surgeon because he went through it. I can celebrate that. I can think positive about that and promote that and stop calling him a coon and Candace and all of those. I can at least say, you know what? Let me not spend so much energy and anger and clowning you and dragging you down with us like crabs in the barrel. And I can celebrate that you got the hell out the damn barrel and bring me with you. <laughs> That's what I think, bro. So I think those things are the things that we have to implement. I think we have to program it and I think we have to follow it. And then we will see the results of this love amongst ourselves that will create the need for other people to want that love and respect that love and follow that love. When you see a group of people you respect, you want to be part of them. 
we those of us who be, were gang members that was exactly what it was we we saw that group and we was like man they tight they look like something that i want to be part of let me join that i converted to islam for the same reason i was around brothers who i was like whoa that's a family i want that when they see that love amongst us, anybody, I don't care where you're from, you got polka dots and and then and, and unmatching stripes in your skin. You're going to see the love among black people. You're going to join that and you're going to respect it and you're going to learn about it. And that will, it'll, it'll, it'll rub off on you in your own life. That's my program. <laughs> yeah. If I may, I want to just tag, tag along with what, what brother Taj just said. Um, it's, it's so important. I mean, I think that, you know, when he talks about the radical hatred and, and I want to talk about us having that love, self-love for our children and our future generations. We hear, and I, you know, I say, you know, I'm the gray beard, but, you know, we hear people my age or older always saying, well, these young folks, this, these young folks, that. But, you know, we were having a conversation the other day, uh, myself and some young ladies, and it was like, well, you know, all the people say, well, things are better than they were before. But it's like the younger generation is like, you saying it's better than what it was before, but I haven't seen that shit. And it goes back to my statement earlier about the, the, the 80s and the 30 years of low that we got kind of stuck into as people. And that radical hate actually drove that. When you look back at what happened in the 80s? What was the critical two, the two most critical things that happened to black families in the 80s? Drugs and minimum mandatory sentences and the prison complex. They destroyed, locked, us, locked up the fathers and left the mothers on drugs. And when you have two generations of children that have grown up basically parentless, at some point, we have to, as a black community, stop saying them bad kids or this, that, and, and say, you know what? We gotta love them because they are us. And we've gotta fix what we didn't, we, we got bamboozled into falling into calling our own kids criminals and bad people when in fact, I know it's overused saying being a product of an environment, but it was, it was an institutionally systemic environmental situation that was set up for what we're witnessing right now and the only way we're going to truly change our path forward is we have to step back and say how do we reach our children that's a good one that's a good one chris and brother chris and brother charles just kind of to to speak to the point like you're saying like for black community and what we owe it for because for me i put it i put a lot of weight of it on myself a lot of weight of I know better I should do better that's why there's been times where you know, there's a job uh, that comes in and it's like yo we have this position it's just like but I'm already doing this I already have this wherewithal I'm just going to shoulder this front now because what I want to do is make sure that it's very apparent that it's not hard to make these decisions to one get out the hood if you want to get you a degree if you want to get you some bread on you if you want to protect you and yourselves and your family if you want to as well. Like it's not hard to do so, it just seems impossible. And I think for me, the, the pathway of, of being an entrepreneur has been able to, to reaffirm that idea because if I can feed myself, I can feed somebody else, right? And in the hood, the, the, the worst thing or, or the overarching theme is there ain't no jobs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get this money. Right. And that's how we start to devalue ourselves. And then we're able to shoot each other. Right? We're able to kill each other. Gang bangers going in every hood, the pyro cribs, everyone to have you have you be. Ain't nobody shooting these white cops. Right. They know who not to shoot, but they will shoot one of us because they've already devalued us. So I think that repair of the black community, like listening to Brother Taj and Brother Chris, like it's, the love part is something I haven't really thought of. Cause I'm more in like just the go, go, go mode, but it's very true. Like to, like to Sean and even our, our friends back home, it's everything like I have the same circle. And I tell them, I love all my friends, especially if I'm in contact with you now, because there's a lot of snakes that come around. There's a lot of jammers, speed bumps. 
like that come around and try to figure out things on the other end and try to kind of kind of be sinister about it. But what I do know is that those snakes are just misunderstood as far as they just don't know no better, right? The repair of the black community is imperative. I, I tell this to Sean and everybody I can is that we can at least get the foot in the door when we start thinking economically. When we can get some, some dollars in our pocket to be able to have some economic buying power to make sure that we ain't gonna have no, once we're able to sit there and say that this is what's gonna take our bread, this is what's gonna take our money, that stops a whole nother conversation. Like I don't wanna mess with my money getting made. I don't wanna mess with anything else happening to me as far as making me bread, right? That economic financial stability, that being able to pro provide for your family. And it, it's, it's, it's crucial, right? It's crucial. Um, being able to, to have sustainability to the point where you can provide those jobs to someone who would otherwise go and sell some you know, it's, it's To me, that's groundbreaking and that's something I'm striving for to this day. That, that's a beautiful point. If I can just cut in very quickly. I want to say something about what happened to me because I, you know, it's important that when we have these philosophies, when we come to these epiphanies, um, I think about what Chris did and what he's doing, understand that they're gonna be tested, right? The, the, the things that we arrive at, that we really are convicted about in our mind that we think are gonna work. It's my opinion that we're gonna be tested. I can sit up here and talk all I want about radical love and loving ourselves because we're black, I had that, uh, that philosophy before I got shot and I realized I'm being tested because the chances are who shot, I don't know who shot me. I never saw them, but there's a pretty good chance that the person who shot me was another black person. So in the same way I was saying um, to Sean, like I can look at you, I can look at you Hundo and see myself and therefore see the value because I can see it in myself, then therefore I must see it in you. I love myself. I'm pretty good <laughs> on that. I have no doubt. I love this. I love this shit out of myself. So if I see you and I see me and you, I, I owe you that love. I can tell you that whole philosophy was tested. When I got shot, I felt every bullet. I counted them. I knew how many times I got shot. I tasted the gunpowder in my mouth. And I knew he had ran off. And I was mad as hell. I was hurling curses, <laughs> like asking Allah, asking God to curse him and his mama. But when I sort of got my faculties back, even after, as I sat in the hospital and thought about what happened to me, I began pitying that person. I, I began pitying them because when they failed, so you gotta, you know, they didn't kill me. They didn't rob me. So you gotta walk away with your failure. But I began thinking, do I really believe that we should love each other? I'm not gonna shoot somebody for the sake of that. I just, I don't have that. I'm, I don't wanna kill you. I don't wanna hurt you. I'm not trying to rob you. But do I really feel that way now that I've been tested? Now that a black man has shot me in the face, how do I really think about him? Do I really love him? Can I, I didn't said it. I can tell you, I'm pretty pissed off. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. But if I found out who did it and he happened to be black, I could exercise that radical love and forgiveness simply because of what I just said. We owe it to each other. It's radical, but that's the way Chris mentioned it also. We got a lot of stuff to overcome, a lot of things that we have to heal from and the obstacles, we got to overcome those. So what do we do? We got to do the exact opposite. We've been preached white superiority. The answer is not black superiority. Most of the shit that we said about that didn't make no sense. We said things like we're kings and queens. Somebody got to be ruled, <laughs> ain't, everybody, ain't everybody the king, ain't everybody the queen. But 
we we try to use the same thing against those who use that stuff against us. We got to go in a different direction. Every single one of you, as I listened to you, I heard one thing. I shifted the paradigm. I didn't do what was expected. I went in a different direction. I went over here and explored something I never saw before. Man, brothers, you talking about you want a key? That's our key as well. We got to start doing things different and being courageous and having the balls to do it because the people will come. All you got to do, I say, look at our history. Look at Harriet Tubman. Everything she did was unexpected. They thought that she was crazy. We think back now, she got hit upside the head and the brain damage made her free <laughs> because everybody else accepted slavery. What she did was a shift in paradigm. And that's all we got to do because we can look about our history. It's right there. All we got to do is take that and implement it. I love everything I've heard every one of you say today because it just gives me so much hope, yo, that that's what we're doing. That love, that shifting the paradigm, that doing things different and doing things selflessly is the key. You want to know the key? You've already said it. Every single one of you. I'm, I'm looking at Hundo. You are the example. You go forward, I'm going to be right behind your ass. <laughs> that is, those are the keys. We, we've heard them. We've heard them right here on the show. Those are the answers. You all have had it. I, I heard it come out of your mouth. That's the key. And I, I apologize for <laughs> just jumping in and just throwing my thoughts. But, but I, I think it's very important that we follow our convictions and then when they're tested, because they're going to be tested, this whole Black Lives Matters, oh, really? That's what everybody's saying, oh, really? Let me see it. I hear you're talking, I hear you're marching, I hear you're saving, wa waving your fist. You got, I got it on my T-shirt right now. <laughs> I, I got it on my T-shirt right now. But it don't mean shit until we get it tested and we, we prove it, it becomes a proof. We, and every one of you, I've heard you, every one of you talk about the steps that need to be taken. Please believe me, you are on the program. All you have to do is continue. When the tests come, they're going to come. <laughs> they're going to come. The snakes are coming. But some of them are our own people. <laughs> and then we got to learn how to deal with it, right? <laughs> we got to be merciful. We got to, because we know, like the brother said, they don't know. We know. They don't know. What happens when you see around people you, that don't know? You teach them, right? You're, you're merciful to them. You teach them. That's what we have to continue to do, my brothers and all my sisters that are listening. You've heard every solution just from these four or five gentlemen. You've heard it, and they are putting it into practice. Yeah, it's really that simple, isn't it? It's not that complicated. You hear it makes sense, don't it? <laughs> So I, I just want to reiterate my appreciation. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me hear you. I would have went on today and just been ignorant. I appreciate hearing the wisdom and the intelligence and seeing your example. Thank you so much for allowing me in. I am not allowing you in. My story is easy to tell. But thank you for letting me in. Thank you for opening the window and letting me peek in and see what's on your stove. I appreciate that <laughs> so much. Uh, again, thank you. We appreciate you, Brother Taj, and I just, I love the passion, man. Anytime I feel passion, and I'm, I want to be very specific. I didn't say hear passion. I felt that, you know, my, my heart, like it's still pounding a little bit. It's a little warm, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I feel you, bro. That's much love. Um, Hundo P, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Ah, oh, man, some things are better said without being said, my brother. I appreciate the opportunity, brother. Thank you, man. Of course. Thanks all. Thank you to all of you is what I really wanted to say, if anything. No doubt. Um, so I just, I want us to begin our exit, but this is, this is my last question, and this is than that it's just a personal reflection but maybe within us reflecting on our own personal things that we need to address because we we've touched on it a little bit 
but I just want us to really end as black men. What do you guys think that we need to address within ourselves in order to create strong families that want to uplift the black community? Just as an individual black man in this space right now. I think I, I want to I want to turn in, especially being that with the music. And the reason why I want to talk about the music is, you know, we all do the rap. You know, we have we have all these different genres, and rap especially. I think we as black men, we have to take our rightful places within our families. And and when I say that, and, and I say our rightful places as being the head of household, that doesn't mean that we're standing above our wives, and our wives should be subservient. But we we are the foundation and the rock. We all have have our roles, and if we can take our part and learn to be there and respect and hold our black women up, our black women have been so mistreated and just dealt with in such a way, and we, you know, we've. As 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 I said, you know, we we're perpetuating what perpetuated on us to on, against our women. You know, we since when did we come to the point to where it's okay to call our women bitches and hoes and every other word that come out of our mouth? And I always, you know, and I and, and the thing I always told my boys when I was raising them up, I said, look, you have a mother. You know, it's just, one day you're gonna have a daughter. Would you want somebody calling your mama a bitch in a hoe, your daughter a bitch in a hoe, or your sister a bitch in a hoe? So why is it okay for you to do this to someone else? I understand we get caught up in emotions. We are, we're, we're emotional beings, but when you're consciously doing that, all we're doing is tearing down our own families. And you know, I think that's where it starts. We just got we have we have to have respect for our own roles as, as, as fathers and as, as a black family unit. I'll, uh, I'll say that it was a lot of work that has been put in place to destroy it, right? There's been a lot of work put in place to destroy the foundation of a successful and a loving black family. It's kind of weird, you know, to, just to see the intention that's been in place to be a whether it like he said a, a section eight housing how there can be the man at the house or or how, how there's uh, uh the the thought process that uh the black man don't want the black woman he want a white woman or or, or mexican woman or it was some or the preference over a black woman right and i've seen these men in action and growing up to me it was always weird right because a little bit about myself is just like shoot i didn't even know there was uh, dual parent house, uh, dual parent uh, uh, houses or, or or families until high school or some shit, you know. But it was just because of what I was around, and then throughout all that, getting me through. So I have a very proud. My mom got me through the college. I got through college. My mom is my greatest asset ever. Like she she made a monster out of me, right? And but I, there's a lot of things I had to learn on my own, just because that's just how it is growing up. Here. And that being said how dare any of us go back and then degrade the very women who are really willing to go and do the fire force. When I was down here in Houston doing the protest, the black women were on the front line, leading that, right? Lead, led us out onto the highway where they had the big Clydesdales of horses come and try to corral us and everything. And they busted out all the pepper spray and guns and everything. Like the black women was fearless in that. And I think there's been a time where we have thought that, you know what? Yeah, black women are strong. They're going to keep, keep continue to be strong and they can just, you know, uh, matriarch the whole movement or the whole household. But see, that's because we have forgotten our place. That's how I feel. I feel that we need to get back up on these feet as men bring back our, our prosperity to our communities that are ravaged with liquor stores and gun stores gas stations that aren't even owned by us. All these things are hard to do, but it's every step necessary for us to bring those prosperity and pride back to ourselves, especially as black men. 
especially as black men. Like we owe it to ourselves, right? For no other reason that because if we don't, then somebody else will. Why not us, right? Why can't we get our community right? Why can't we build ourselves back up? Back there in Denver, they got the Downing Super, Downing Super is for sale. There's a lot of discussion about who wants to go ahead and put some money in to buy it. It shouldn't even have been a discussion. That's prime real estate. Put some bread together. Let's go get that, right? But I feel like a lot of black men are looking for some sort of, someone asking them to do so. Waiting for it to be handed out for them like, hey, you should go do this. Like the path of least resistance is disgusting. You got to go through that fire, through that jungle. And I think that'll build us back up. And that's what we need to do. Yeah, I personally just, uh, just to echo everybody, um, support, man, support for ourselves, support for one another. Um, not asking for handouts or discounts from each other, um, paying the full price, no matter what it is, every time, anytime. Um, and then also not just from ourselves, but standing our price when other people ask for it too. I think that there's a tendency maybe to want to appeal to the to the needs of the common or, or to just sell your product. Um, but there's also value in standing true to the value in your product and to you as a person as a product. So uh, just standing firm in, in your price and I don't mean just your monetary price, but your uh, your spiritual price, your uh, your educational price, what have you, whatever it is that you um, that you feel is who you are. But knowing that that's who you are, and um, being willing to not accept anything less than what you're worth, I think that's very important. Uh, and in saying that, it's also supporting each other on that path. Um, walk through. The, I, I love the the, the quote. Um, you know, walk through the fire. Um, and I also know that uh, when you walk through the fire with somebody else, you can look to your, to your left or to your right and say, I'm in this with you. Uh, so it's supporting each other through the fire. It's not just pushing somebody out and saying, oh, it's your turn to walk. We're going to see how you come out. Uh, it's actually walking hand in hand and um, being willing to take the burns along the way with, that, with those people and with our people. Um, and that's, that's just my piece that I'll say towards that. Yeah, brothers, let me just chime in and, and step in really quick because I actually have to leave the meeting. I don't want to. Uh, I, man, this has been just a full get together to be quite honest. And I, it's kind of hard to hear you, Brother Tosh. Might have froze on us. We'll give it like five more seconds. Oh, all right. Well, whether we're able to hear Brother Taj's last few statements, um, I just want to acknowledge all the wisdom that you all have collectively shared and Danny, you already know, man, we be planning on the fly. We didn't really get to hear as much from you as we normally have in the past. However, I do think what we do together is really important in terms of bridging this dialogue because our allies need to hear what we need in, in terms of Black investment, Black commerce. The, the, the allies need to understand how it is that we've struggled to have any sort of economic or social success. And I think it's important for everybody who's been listening to hear that it's hard out here, you know? I don't wanna say the traditional is hard out here for a pimp. You know, it's hard out here to be a man and it's hard out here to be a father. You know, my, my baby's in the background, my lady's in the background. And like, I, I, I don't have any answers. You know what I mean? I, I just try to do my best. and. I try to surround myself with visionaries such as yourselves to keep myself humble and grounded in this fight for ourselves. Because when it comes down to it, that's, that's who I need. I need me, but I also need us to be successful. So that being said, I am going to begin our exit here.
for anybody who is watching online, Facebook Live, feel free to participate. Panelists, feel free to participate. But we are gonna breathe out and bless out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I'm doing this right too, because I got my little my little Jordan flop sign, you know how we do. <laughs> but I got my back straight. <clears throat> I'm closing my eyes. Feel free to close your eyes if you're comfortable. If you're not comfortable, that's all good. And just listen to your heart. Feel your heart out for a little bit. Pay attention to it. Feel the blood running through your veins. Feel all the emotions, feel the thoughts. Because a lot was discussed and honestly a lot is being prophesied. We're being called to a greater purpose. And now let's take our first deep breath through the nose. and hold it in the stomach and release through the mouth. And every time we release, I want us to sink our shoulders further into our bodies. I want us to really practice this relaxation because the world is always on our shoulders. So we need to learn how to relax. And I say this as somebody who has struggled with relaxation and who only wants to get better. One more time through the nose. Hold it in your chest. And breathe out through the mouth. Relax those shoulders. Relax your mind. On a count of three, we're gonna take a really deep breath, as deep as you can go. One, two, three. Breathe in through the nose. Hold it in your neck. And release through the mouth. Sit with this for about three to five seconds, and then we'll open our eyes again. Take a leap, have some faith, have a sip, quench your thirst, do something fun, live a little, young one, be all you can be and everything you are not, for no one is watching, no one is judging. If they do judge, don't hold a grudge, just smile, shake it off, send them a whole lot of love. It is them, not you, rather something bigger than us both too. We all search, many find, but this could take many lifetimes. So be patient with each other. We don't know one another's struggle. Be kind, be gentle. Every human has something special. So take a leap, have a sip, do something fun for no one is watching 
we are the only ones watching ourselves. And Danny has something that he wants to add real quick. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks for everything everyone said. This is, as Sean said, like I, I felt this conversation like deeply. Um, and if you're listening, if you learn something, if something resonated with you, um, share this. Um, like share what touched you, share what you learned. Like this video is on Facebook. Facebook lets you download it. It doesn't even have to be soul stories. You can make it your own. But I mean, I don't, I would hate to see this like wisdom lost on just one night. Like, and that's what's really great about um, the whole recording and video generation that we're in. Um, Cause there's just so much to learn from everything everybody said to me. Definitely. And thank you, Hundo P, for sharing those last few words, because I feel like we do have to get youthful in our spirit and our curiosity. You know, now is a great time to, even though we're, we're, we're dealing with something that we haven't dealt with before, you know, I'm having conversations with uh, my staff team at Youth on Record, and we're wondering, like, what, what is school even going to look, what is school going to look like? Pardon so. Um, what are we, what are we doing? you know, mm -hmm. for, for transparency. Like, are we even safe going back to school? Or are we safe performing? Are we safe doing, you know, projects and construction or, or meeting in the artistic communities? Like, in all seriousness, like, what the fuck are we doing, you know? And I think everything that we spoke on, that's what we need to be doing. Um, we have to figure it out. We have to figure out a way to get that grocery store. Me and Jamila have been talking about that, you know, throughout the last few weeks. It's just, we need to figure it out right now. And my last thought is, if you guys have anything that you want to share, please let everybody on Facebook Live know. And we'll also post it on Soul Stories Denver and Babytown Production. So if, if you have anything that's coming up, or you want to let people know about your business or your firms, uh, feel free to give yourself a shout out at this time. Hey, I'm already uh, muted, I guess. So I'll go first. But uh, yeah, catch me on www.livehundop.com. Um, check out the brand LHP, Live Happy, Live Hundo P. New track coming out every 20th of the month. Uh, you can find me on Spotify, iTunes, all that, any of that. Um, the track is called um, Summer's Darkness. Um, right now, the popping and popping and track right now that I got is called Arizona. So I'm 30, I got 35,000 plays on Spotify. Streams don't mean much, but I do appreciate y'all listening. Get a little bit changed off that. Uh, and then in addition, uh, if there's anybody in the crowd who is in the greater Colorado area um, who is looking for resources or needs um, therapeutic resources, please feel free to reach out via my website. Um, and or on my Instagram at hundop24. Um, and also, not that I have to be a resource, but I would be more than happy to find you the resources you are looking for. Um, so please feel free to reach out. And last but not least, any of y'all want to start sliding sideways once the winter comes around, hopefully we'll be able to go back to, uh, you know, doing outdoor activities and things like that. But please feel free to contact me for a private lesson. I am nationally certified. Um, and I do teach all levels, all ages, and all skills in this, on the snowboarding discipline. So I just want to say thank you, Sean. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Taj. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you, Danny, for having just coming out, Sean, and but also um, for all the brothers and all the fellas out here. Thanks for coming out, y'all. I've learned a lot from being here in y'all's presence. So thank you. Yes, I'll go ahead and chime in here. Thanks to everyone for being on. I, I really appreciate it, having this conversation and enjoy, you know, the thought-provoking conversation that we've had tonight. Um, and definitely look forward to um, being on, on something like this again in the future. Um, but, you know, 
um, Empowered Creative Group is is the name of the company. Again, we're we're here for the creatives, and you know we're looking to, to launch the platform here and go live in September. So if you want to learn more about it, go out to www.empowered and that's empowered with it with an ed at the end, creative with a k. dot com, and you can see about you know kind of learn a little bit more about us. We're we're steadily putting more and more content on the website as we're going through and doing some of the content creation phases with some of the artists and we're putting little drops on there and things like that. So go out, take a look and um, feel free. We have a little chat bot on there and, and then you can also um, reach out to us via email as well. Thanks. All right, cool. Cause I was, I was trying to use something else, my bad. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was good to be on this. It was good to be uh, amongst the other brothers sharing their stories and their insights and how everybody is progressively moving forward, you know, in our communities, you know, being a voice for them. Um, like I said, I'm down here in Houston, Houston, Texas, though, with my, my construction firm, Reed's Estimating and Contracting. But I also uh, have deep ties with Denver and I go back there as often as I can. So if there's anybody that around that play needs um, estimating services or even just project, uh, project build outs from shops or anything, just uh, look up uh, readsestimating.com. That's R E I D S E S T I M M A T I N G. Um, e S T I S T M A T I N G. Yeah. Um, dot com. And uh, just go ahead and just uh, use those links and go through there and put the email in, and I'll be able to get the info. Word up, y'all. Well, really appreciate Chris. I'm giving y'all a special shout out. Because Tennessee, y'all on a whole nother time zone. Houston, y'all on a whole nother time zone. Me and Hundo P and Danny, we've been chilling here in Colorado. But I'm going to let y'all get the funk out of here, yo. Peace, love, infinite blessings.